Hello and welcome to Apex Extra Live, Drive Top Line Growth with Triple Bottom Line Thinking with Suhas Apti and Jag Shet. My name is Kia Wood, Guest Associate Editor at Apex. Before we begin, I'd like to run through a few details. At the end of the presentation, we will save time for a question and answer session. If you look at the right toolbar on your screen, you'll see a questions box. To ask your question at any time during the presentation, simply type it in the box and click send. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's broadcast, please call GoToWebinar Tech Support at 1-805-617-7000. Again, that's 1-805-617-7000. This presentation is being recorded and will be available on the Apex YouTube channel early next week. All res registrants will receive an email with a link to the recording once it is available. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Suhas Apti is president of Apti Consultants and a partner in the Blue Earth Network. He formerly served as global sustainability officer and president of the European family care business at Kimberly Clark. Jag Inshet is the Charles H. Kelstad Professor of Marketing in the Goizeta Business School at Emory University. He has published more than 300 papers and 30 books. Both Suhas and Jag co-wrote the Apex Magazine November-December 2017 feature article, Seven Steps to Sustainable Procurement, which is available online at apex.org slash magazine. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Suhas Apti and Jag Shet. Suhas and Jag, you may begin. Thank you. Thank you, Kia. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of both Jag and myself, I'd like to first thank Apex for giving us this opportunity to share our learnings and insights and how a company can make sustainability a competitive advantage and deliver both top line growth and bottom line improvements. Today's seminar, we will do a tag team approach. So I will cover a few slides and then uh, Jag will cover some other few slides. So uh, let me just flip over to the. Let's first go back and look at challenges. As most of you are aware of this, that we do face a lot of global challenges. Unfortunately, both the scope and the magnitude of challenges is increasing. And these are the challenges which are forcing and driving the shift towards more sustainable organizations. Let's look at what are these driving forces which are driving this shift. When you look at the very first one, we have identified that as innovation. What has happened is both the pace of innovation is rising fast and the lifespan of innovation is becoming shorter and shorter. Previously, if you came up with some new idea or new innovation, you at least had a breathing room of a couple of years before anybody could copy you. Today, that copying occurs within a year, so you have to capitalize on the innovation as soon as you are able to and continue to innovate, that's the only way you can survive and create competitive advantage. Second challenge which all of us are facing is obviously population increase. As most of you know, current population is around 7.6 billion people and is forecasted to go to over 9.7 billion by 2050. For us to have sustainable development goals, this increase in population is a challenge by itself. Other challenge which is compounding this is the concentration of population growth is occurring in poorer countries. That presents another challenge for a sustainable development goals. Third area of what we need to look at is resources. Natural resources are finite. With the growth in population as well as rising standards, if everybody in the in the uh, uh, everybody into the uh, consuming everybody starts consuming at the Western standards, we will require 2.3 planets to meet the needs. And all of us know that we do not have 2.3 planets. That talks about not only sustainable production but we need to have a mindset for also sustainable consumption going forward. 
fourth aspect is economic inequality. Uh, though all of us have experienced economic growth, stock market is at its high. The reality is even in the United States, top 10% of families hold 80% of the wealth and bottom 50% of the families hold only 1% of the wealth. In the United States, 25% of the population earn less than $10 an hour or $20,000 per year. This difference becomes even stark and larger when you look from a global perspective, because globally, 90% of the wealth is with 10% of the population. There are 2 billion people on this planet who earn less than $2 a day. Next one is uh, CO2. Obviously, scientific facts show that the rise in carbon dioxide is raising the temperature of Earth. We not only have to arrest this rise, but we have to come up with solutions in order to reduce the absolute CO2 emissions if we want to make sure that the oceans don't rise. Unfortunately, U.S. government has pulled out of Paris Accord, but the good part is most leading companies are committed to reducing their carbon footprint and not following the government direction. You all must have noticed the trust. Average consumers do not trust institutes, governments or companies. Therefore, concrete action is required to back up words and promises. And the last global challenge which I'll talk to you about is obviously social media. What that has done is a problem in the remote part of the world becomes a PR nightmare for the companies. And today, active consumers can change opinion about your products in a flash. So you need to not only manage what your products are, but also about the perception of the product. I will turn it over to Dr. Shade who will now talk to you about competitive advantage. Thanks, Suhas. The history of competitive advantage is very fascinating. <clears throat> Ever since the industrialization of the society, shifting from agriculture to the industrial age, industries or the companies have looked at something that will actually transform the whole way we do business and gain a competitive advantage. In addition to, of course, the patent regime and getting licenses and all the stuff, from a manufacturing, procurement, and a supply chain viewpoint, it's very fascinating. The first major breakthrough happens with mass production. As you know, at one time, production would be local, consumption will be local, but it now begins to become mass production and assembly line principle. Uh, Henry Ford was the innovator in that area. While the automobile was really invented by the Germans, we made it into a scale oriented. And we have seen other examples like the Kodak well, I'm not, um, cameras, uh, the Timex watch just goes on and on. Competitive advantage now shifts in fact from there to more and more automation. Not only automation in the factory as we know, like robots doing more work, but the automation at the workplace, the sort of a, office space became very key. Word processors came in and suddenly you had a surplus of sort of the typing people and the pool, you know, stenotypists as we used to call them. That's basically now moving to more and more professional category. In the 80s, it becomes all about TQM, total quality management. And that became a major issue because globally we were not competitive, especially against Japan, who had actually gone after using Ward Deming's approach in statistics, quality process control, and began to really move Japan from a country of low price, low quality products to high quality, good price products. By the way, what, what Japan did has been followed by Korea and now China. And China is rising as a major competitor and therefore global competitiveness is not TQM anymore. We have all equalized. From TQM, then in the 80s, we begin to shift toward what is known as CRM. Started more like a relationship management between suppliers and customers. I did a lot of work in that area, I had a center, but it is now all about large scale data mining. CRM has become an IT platform and companies actually benefit enormously 
gaining a competitive advantage like consumer insights, consumer feedback. And now you see very clearly the rise of artificial intelligence and, uh, and maybe virtual reality. This is real. In fact, I've seen the whole cycle of uh, automation from production to physical distribution logistics to, in fact, commerce, which we've already seen now. Ultimately, now there's an automation of consumption where at home you have robots who are becoming your personal helpers, personal assistants. And therefore, the question is, what is the next frontier for sustainable competitive advantage? And our view, Suhas, and my view is that it is going to be all about sustainability. Countries like China and India, which are rising nations with large consumer populations, surprisingly, it is not the capital, nor is it technology, but what will, what will slow down the global growth and their growth is the environment. Environment is the one that I think we all have to learn how to manage. And that is where any industry or a company begins to shift its position and takes a stand is likely to become a strong competitive advantage for them. How do you do it? Ultimately, nothing happens in a corporate world without the top management commitment. And our view, Suhas, and my view is that the shareholder obsession has to give way to more and more shared value as a new concept or a stakeholder value as a new concept where it's doing well by doing good. In other words, what can you do to the community? What can you do to the employees? What can you do to the suppliers? And how do you motivate them to engage with you, creating value for them, not just for your shareholders, which is a one key dimension. We are also finding that in the area of sustainability, environmental sustainability, markets are inefficient. There are many market failures. People have tried to introduce green products and the consumers have not accepted. So it is not being driven by the markets, but driving the markets, shaping the expectations, influencing, persuading is very key. And that is the framework that we have used around here to say that going forward, sustainability is not only something you embrace in the company, but it is something where you become the ambassador, where you become uh, the, 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 the promoter essentially in many ways. And therefore it is really sustainability is a marketing problem. Ultimately, not only you have to convince yourself and your own employees, but you have to convince the rest of the world why it is good for the society, it is good for the industry, and actually it is good in fact for the company in the process. To me, that's a very key change. So let's look at the benefits. And this is a typical debate. <laughs> I can raise the price, but it's gonna cost you more. I can give you more quality. I think we are so brainwashed with this trade-off mentality, either or. What we are finding more and more through the data and the evidence is that one can do both. I can increase the quality and reduce the cost at the same time. So sustainability is in that category. People presume that by providing sustainability efforts, such as environmental aspects or a compliance with, let's say, EPA regulations will be more costly. Evidence shows actually that it is less costly. And those which are sustainable funds, uh, what are called SRI, mutual funds, when you compare them about their financial performance, return that you get in those funds versus others, you can clearly see that it not only does the stakeholder returns, but also the shareholder returns. This is the very important discovery because both engineering and economics as a disciplines are founded on an inherent belief that we have to make a trade-off. It's duality. But this is more like the yin and the yang, both of them, not one. So either or is never a good thinking going forward. It is end. This sounds like a great lecture, typical academic style. And there are challenges how to implement because we'll have lots of skeptics inside the organization and outside the organization. So it's a question of how do you market them properly? One of the biggest challenges inside the organization, unfortunately, is a huge resistance by people who are pretty happy with status quo management. I found a great thing 
why good companies fail was a very key question I was asked by one of the CEOs and I had no answer. So I did all the research and I found out all great companies decline, die, not because of competition, but because when the environment has changed, you are unable or unwilling to change. Internal resistance is massive. There's an inertia for change. And I think managing that internal cultural change is equally important. And we always think about it's a people issue in the organization. I find fascinating that people are the most moldable resource in an organization. I can shape them. I can influence them. As we have seen some extraordinary leaders come as a CEOs or chairman of the company, transform the company altogether from where it used to be to where it needs to go. But the most hard change in the organization are the policies, the procedures, et cetera. Whether it's an order entry procedure, for example, billing and collection procedure, those are hardwired. And they're often hardwired with the old IT legacy systems, which is why you find today more than 40% of the budget in IT actually goes more toward mobile computing and is in the hands of the marketing people, not in the, let's say, chief information officer in a company. It's the same debate. Like the quality movement, sustainability has to be a like a chief sustainability officer reporting directly to the cabinet, the chairman, and the board even to bring about a change internally. It's a leadership, it's a top down in many ways, not a bottom up some fashion. At the same time, we have multiple stakeholders. As Suas mentioned, it is not just what we do inside, but the world in some remote part of somewhere in the world discovers us through YouTube or some other mechanism. Social media is very important. There is no some such thing as our personal life and our professional life. You cannot separate it anymore as the politicians are finding out, the entertainment people are finding out, so are the corporate executives. And therefore, the issue around here is that how do we manage and juggle multiple stakeholders with very different demands by each one of them, from social activists, maybe part of NGOs, to suppliers on the other hand, to your own employees, to your investors. And of course, there is media out there and there's a government out there. And to me, a great, great leader ultimately is able to manage and balance this conflicting and diverse interests or diverse objectives and the missions of the organization by and large, or the society for that matter. And the last one, of course, is that ultimately nothing works in business unless it shows you some financial results. So how do you monetize these initiatives? Are these actually cost reduction strategies as we implement? Are they actually growing the top line revenue? And what we find in our research, which is fantastically done, Suas did a lot of work actually. He had all set of chief sustainability officers worldwide. He's a part of that network. As we began to identify world-class companies, we found that it is actually possible to increase the top line revenue and reduce the cost at the same time, which again is the message that we made. It is not either or, but it is both. So we can think about how to move forward about creating a value for everybody and energizing different stakeholders. So what we have done is to come out with a book called The Sustainability Edge. Uh, this book has got probably more editorial support from maybe 25, 30 different magazines. Top leadership magazines have said, this is the message CEO and the chairman needs to hear. Supply chain, uh, transportation in your case, for example, logistics by and large. It has, it has struck a chord in the marketplace, it looks like, which is great. It's very gratifying for us because we put more than three years of hard work doing research around here. And what we found is appealing to people is a framework of nine stakeholders, which is on the next slide. What we find is that there are nine stakeholders and one can classify them into three categories. Stakeholders that Suhas and I call doers which are the consumers, customers that come between us and the end users, like a procurement officer in a company or a retailer, uh, like a Walmart or an Amazon, whoever they are, and employees. Those are the three doer organizations or stakeholders. Then we have the three enablers, 
suppliers is my favorite personally i'm gonna tell you there's nothing better than a good supplier making more creating more value for the company than what we do ourselves so suppliers is another very key component how do you attract investors which are enablers through their capital investing into this almost a cause related business in some fashion a purpose driven business and investing in communities communities are great enablers they provide community resources natural resources infrastructure resources and they expect you to be a good citizen in that community so we call them as enablers and the last three are the more unique ones you know companies need to learn how to leverage media positively media is a phenomenal force in society especially in democratic open societies they can be great amplifiers good uh, message deliverers for us or they can be a bottleneck at the same time so what is a challenge how do you make it into an opportunity and during times when reputation of the institutions is declining it is even more important to make sure that we make media understand the way we do business partnering with governments governments influence markets policy makes a difference whether it's a fiscal policy like the tax issues or it's a monetary policy like the interest rates or uh, qe qe2 qe3 pumping more money uh, money into the economy that's a very key so how can you get government bureaucrats or government policy makers who come from very different disciplines they're not necessarily business people they all, always have a mistrust of the business how do you work with them to make sure that they support this particular issue as opposed to lobbying on the other side for example and the last one and very key powerful force out there in all civil societies is actually the ngos if you partner well with ngos they become your great great amplifiers and actually very much uh, uh, enablers to you in many ways great supporters so those are the nine stakeholders framework we created and what we did was to create a chapter for each one of them as to great companies how they do it how they motivate consumers how they motivate employers employees how they motivate partners how they motivate ngos to participate as a partnership going journey together i will stop here and pass it on back to somos um, as jack pointed it out to you at the end of the day in a corporation we have to monetize everything so very first thing from our experiences what we are suggesting to all companies is if you have any sustainability initiative don't do the sustainability initiative just for the sake of being green the sustainability initiative needs to deliver one of the four things when you look at the bottom half of this chart it needs to obviously lower cost which improves your profitability or it needs to lower risk which also reduces your cost in some different fashion but sustainability played well can also increase your revenue and sustainability played well can also enhance the brand value so if you have an initiative always ask a question is it delivering one of those four things and if it is not delivering any one of those four things you should not entertain that initiative going forward i'd like to share with you uh, something on motivating consumers we have nine stakeholders we don't have enough time to cover all nine stakeholders but we plan to cover maybe two stakeholders give you a flavor of what we are talking about motivating consumers is the hardest thing to do but once you figure it out how to connect the dots on consumer trends and social issues with the brand magic occurs and when the magic occurs you will see that brand value can go up it will create new business it will you can gain new channels and i'd like to share some of the examples with you the very first example we are going to talk to you about clorox clorox as most of you know is a chemical bleach company clorox few years ago conducted a mega trend study which showed four key drivers to change consumer behavior health and wellness multicultural marketplace convenience and environmental sustainability 
and then they started to shape their strategic plan based upon these mega trends and they acquired bird bee business after acquiring bird bee business they realized that there is a need for green cleaning products so they created a product called green works obviously average consumers were skeptical about clorox which is a chemical company that how can they offer a green chemical solution and they blamed them for green washing but by joining hands with sierra club they expanded the green works and today green works is around 5% of their global sales not only this has helped them grow the business in a new channel this has also promoted the company to improve the footprint of their entire product line because they have put out a goal that they will improve the footprint of the entire product line by 50% by 2020 so good things can happen when you focus on the right priorities other example i'll give it to you is from the company i worked for for 34 years uh kimberly clark makes products which improves health and hygiene for everyone so i felt really good working for a company like that but it dawned on me one day that the products what we make are single use products made with natural resources and i'll bet most of you in the room or those who are on webinar can attest to that that's not a sustainable solution over time we started to look at the entire value chain and realized that our responsibilities do not stop at the shelf but our responsibilities go beyond the shelf all the way up to post consumer use waste this program was created in new zealand where we were collecting soil diapers we had a third party who was collecting soil diapers in a huggies bags they were mixing it with green waste and creating composting material it was a stand alone profitable business for this third party what this has done is this has helped us avoid close to 250 million tons of product out of landfill the next example i have is about uh, when the economic crisis occurred in 2008 and 9 everybody those who had experiencing economic crisis the lower income moms did not have enough money to buy diapers we saw this phenomena and realized that huggies which is the dominant brand from kimberly clark can play an important role and we created a program called every little bottom counts those of you who are on the webinar will understand those who have kids they will understand that when your kids are going through diapers buying diapers is like buying shirts when the kids grow up you are left with a lot of diapers which are of smaller size so what we did was we created working with a food bank a diaper bank so that consumers can donate the unused diapers smaller size diapers to the diaper bank and huggy started donating diapers to the diaper bank and now we have close to 12 diaper banks working in united states this program over time has morphed into something called no baby goes unhugged so the program is live and kicking and it, it is delivering to the moms the necessary diapers those who cannot afford it the other example what i i will talk to you about unfortunately we don't have a video but you guys can go look on your own for a, a soap called life boy uh, this is a soap made manufactured by unilever Unilever realized that many many kids do not see the age five, and why do they don't see the age five? Is that's because they pick up infections in villages and small towns, and they die before age five. And a simple solution for all that stuff is just washing your hands. So Life Boy, which is a dominant brand from Unilever, created. a campaign whereby they said that if you wash hands it will save kids in in the villages live beyond age 5 uh so i think you have three different examples here the first example we talked to you about of clorox was increasing new creating new business 
Second one, which I talked to you about from Kimberly Clark about post consumer use waste was enhancing brand value. The third one, which I talked to you about was Huggies every little bottom counts that also was enhancing brand value and life boy so was also increasing sales so you have examples of the top line of the chart what i shared with you that you can increase both top line and enhance brand value now thinking of it in a simplistic term as i said to you magic occurs when you connect the dots i think there is enough consumer data and trends available you have to study them at length you then need to design products and services to make consumption meaningful. And then you need to have a mission driven approach to marketing. And the most important aspect of all this is to communicate in a personal and relevant way. A very good friend of mine always used to say that the key to all this is you need to share with me what's in it for me what's on it for me and what's around me benefits if you can communicate that in a personal way you will engage consumers but task of every marketer in order to motivate consumers still is to continue to educate educate and educate uh, let's talk about another stakeholder what we call ngo uh, when i joined kimberly clark uh, we had looked at NGOs as nuisances because the NGO in general uh, create challenges to the company and they have a different motivation. That's the approach Kimberly Clark also had for Greenpeace. Uh, Greenpeace had come back and shared with us that some of our supply chain coming from boreal forest is not sustainable. Kimberly Clark took pride that they are the first ones in the industry to come up with a fiber policy. They were the first ones to talk about that all our fiber is sourced with a third party certified uh, certification. So they didn't think they were doing anything wrong. Reality is devil is in the details and we didn't really look into what Greenpeace was trying to tell us. And Greenpeace started a campaign called Clear Cut. Uh, it is copied across from a brand called Kleenex. Uh, did it affect the bottom line for Kimberly Clark? Not to much level, but it was a nuisance which they were creating. They were going on campuses. They were disrupting Kimberly Clark presentations. They were climbing onto the office buildings in Kimberly Clark. They were stopping us in supermarkets and harassing our employees. So we took a different approach. We said, you know what we need to do? We need to think about engaging them. And we started to engage with Greenpeace. And eventually we learned that, yes, there was a fault in our supply chain from Boreal Forest. So we worked with them and announced a three-year plan to get out of that supply chain. And that's when I personally learned that most of these NGOs are pragmatic, practical people. They want to see progress on the ground. They're not trying to get you out of the business. And if you continue to show the progress, they will help you become better and better. So Kimberly Clark over time uh, made a deal with uh, Greenpeace. We announced uh, that we have solved our issues they announced the clear cut case is solved. Today, I can tell you, Kimberly Clark engages Greenpeace, and we have been sharing with them before I left. We have been sharing with them five year plans, product development plans out in the future, looking at what are the areas which could be a challenge areas for Kimberly Clark. One of the aspects where they have helped us is just like on post consumer waste one of the challenges what we faced was Kimberly Clark uses wood fiber in order to make majority of the tissue products. So we had an idea saying that why not we look at agricultural waste and use agricultural waste for creating tissue products. Uh, we made some tissue products with wheat straw, but we need required certification. 
And once we have started to engage with them, they helped us create a certification program for these agriculture waste products. And Kimberly Clark Professional Business rolled out a product line made with wheat straw and increased the sales. Uh, key again, uh, from an NGO perspective, is first you need to do materiality analysis to understand what's important and what's material to your company. Once you understand what's material to your company, then you need to vet and select the right partner. There are many NGOs who are experts in different, different areas. You need to find the right partner who can help you. Just like in any relationship, start small and build trust. I think if you seek their expertise, as I shared with you, they are business oriented folks who would like to see that you succeed and you over time nurture relationship by working with them and proactively managing the business risks, working with the NGO partners. And you will have a person who is going to be a loudest broadcast mouth for you as, as your company once you start engaging with them. I'll turn it over to Dr. Shade to talk about next slide. Thanks, Suhas. Um, sustainability is a journey, not a destination. This is where often the board expectations, the chairman's expectations, versus the management expectations and what can be delivered has to be shaped internally. This is very similar to the TQM movement. In the 80s, it took a lot longer and had to bring about cultural changes and processes changes in the company before company could actually become, let's say, customer-centric quality company. So it's a long journey, which I think is a key message. And unfortunately, given the externalities that impacts a stock, stock market or an event outside, <clears throat> this journey is much more difficult to manage. It is a roller coaster. It is like up and down on, on a sort of a country road in some fashion, but it is doable. So let's show you the steps companies have taken in the next slide. Most of this thing begins out of compliance. And of course, since the first energy crisis in the 74, 78, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, was created, was enabled, and became a great enforcer. So companies did it out of necessity, out of compliance, and that's it. And therefore, one would try to do as minimal as possible, meet whatever is required. I think that attitude now changes enormously. It is not only just compliance, a nuisance in some fashion, I guess, but it is also now looking at the eco efficiency. And that begins with carbon trading. Companies begin to understand that energy is a major cost to them. In fact, there are companies, I sit on the advisory board of one of them, where we have found that there are now chief energy officers who are beginning to understand inefficiency in the way we consume electricity or power in general, and how do we make it more and more carbon neutral? The more you save on your carbons, the more it has an economic value. So now it begins to have not only just a nuisance or a compliance, but also an economic outcome, positive outcome. That's very key. And therefore, energy cost reduction becomes almost a good business sense. The next step from here, this is sort of like, it's a matter of time before this will be stakes on the table. Everybody will do it, or what we call in management, a hygiene factor. Now, sustainability moves from good to better by making it as a part of the core strategy. And this is very important. In other words, just as we made quality as a part of the core strategy, or assembly line principle as a core operational strategy, sustainability comes into the same category in the mindset and the evolution of a man of a company by and large and this is very very key mainly because large customers and of all customers surprisingly walmart has become one of those who is now demanding that sustainability is the future for everybody not only they are practicing sustainability remember it is a company that was criticized for destroying small business communities, criticized for not being employee friendly. 
Today, you can see 180 degrees change in the company's attitude. I'm absolutely surprised over 25 years, the transition that has taken place. But today, Walmart will make sure that their suppliers, as big as Procter & Gamble, for example, or anybody else, is also environmentally friendly. You have to do an audit. In fact, uh, my colleague Suhas is engaged in one of those consultancy projects where Walmart is asking for your audit as a supplier to prove that you are carbon neutral or carbon efficient. At least you are not putting uh, sort of the uh, carbon footprint on the society by and large as a way of doing business, which means now it becomes more strategic, which is very fascinating. Customers have enormous power. If Walmart does it today, Amazon will do it tomorrow. Whoever are the key retail customers in the consumer products, and definitely in a B2B market, it is becoming similarly where the number of customers are a handful ones, and they can demand significantly to say, for you to do business with us, you must have sustainability as a part of your core strategy. The last one, of course, is the best, which says, sustainability is really not only just a strategic element but it is the way of doing business it is basically what we call a purpose-driven organization and we have found this is to be true surprisingly true where purpose actually dominates our profit in the mindset of the people so the best examples right now of course are patagonia here is a company that goes out of its way to be environmentally friendly and at the same time is doing very well. IKEA is another company like that out of Sweden, I think, or Scandinavia, and they have a similar message. Ben and Jerry in the ice cream business of all, such a mundane business, but they say that is important in our mindset, what is important. And Whole Foods has gone through this journey themselves. So it is possible that it becomes sort of the essence of uh, your, it's like, it's like, it's, spirituality in, in a corporation very interestingly it is like the religion i believe in this stuff and i know i can make it into a successful business now you achieve so it is like a good to great approach towards sustainability so that's my part of the presentation and i'll turn back to suhas to give you the closing comment uh, as 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 jack said sustainability is a journey but you know from what Peter Drickard taught all of us, if you can't measure it, you don't know whether you're improving. So what we have designed is we have designed a stakeholder sustainability audit tool. It's available online on our website, which every consumer, every stakeholder can take and give their perception about what they think about the company. Company can administer this tool to various stakeholders and get a measurement. I always equate sustainability to like a golf game. You are playing against yourself and what you need to do is continue to improve your score year after year after year. So that concludes what we wanted to present to you. We'll be open to answer any of the questions you guys have. The presentation what you saw today, uh, we have asked Apex team to send you the PDF copy. If you guys are interested in it, you can request it. You can have a PDF copy of that. So I will pass it back to Kia to manage the Q&A session at this point. Thank you, Suhas. And now we have the question and answer period. As a reminder, if you look at the right toolbar on your screen and type in your question in the questions box and you can click send and we'll see it. Um, so I'll give you all a few moments to send in your questions. Um, and I actually have one question already. And so someone asked from a procurement standpoint, what's the key to achieve these uh, two goals of a better quality and better price? Shall I go ahead, Suhas? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Sheik. <clears throat> uh, procurement is probably the most strategic function in a company. I'll give a longer answer to set the context. In my analysis, especially in manufacturing, the value add in the factory is only about 27% or less. 7% labor, 7 or 8% cost of capital, and 7 or 8% management cost used to be 10, 10, 10. And in the PC business, surprisingly, 
value add in the factory is only 11%. 89% is all procurement. Out of which 79% goes to two vendors, or I don't like the word vendors, but suppliers, which is Microsoft and Intel. Think about that. You are struggling at the end, creating value add as a PC assembler, like whether it's IBM ThinkPad, for example, or Dell computers, or HP, or Lenovo, whoever you are, you are not making value add. 89% of the value actually is in the hands of your supplier, which means you have to have a chief procurement officer who is a part of the top management team, I would say as important or next to the chief financial officer. Elevating the procurement officer to that level, very much like in finance at one time, a controller became the CFO, that is not the capability. It's not just operational, but operational, strategic, and how do you partner it? How do you partner with suppliers is a totally different skill set. And often doing a vertical integration, which means mergers, acquisitions, that is a new position we are advocating, becoming a chief procurement officer and always having a direct reporting through the chairman uh, they, they, to the board, actually. And even having a committee like a strategy committee, a procurement committee, all great companies are now beginning to understand the procurement is not just an operational efficiency, but it is a strategic uh, asset by and large. So my view is that yes, you can do negotiate on the delivery and the price as procurement person does, but it is more than that. Um, uh, I will attest to what Dr. Shade said because when I worked for Kimberly Clark, our sales were twenty billion dollars, and among major category of commodities, what we were buying, those commodities added up to twelve billion dollars. Wow! So you can see the importance of procurement officer. Excellent. So you both have talked about the importance of de developing the sustainability efforts um, and a little bit about the consumer perspective, but I was hoping you could talk a little bit more. Um, you gave the example of like Patagonia, who entered the market as sort of a sustainable company and has that their customers are expecting that of them. But let's say it's a different company like McDonald's, where you, one could maybe assume that their customers don't really aren't thinking about sustainability and those that are don't go to McDonald's. So how do you kind of bridge that gap between the perception of your company and taking on these new sustainability efforts in a way that comes across authentic? So has you want to go? Yeah, I think I think you have to look at a broader perspective. I think what McDonald's is trying to do right now, you have to look at what are the social issues Obesity is one of the biggest social issues facing the United States today. So if you are addressing some of the social issues with your brand by changing the food what you offer, the quality of the food, the calorie content of the food, you will be doing service to the society at the same time enhancing your brand. So sustainability simply doesn't mean all the times you have to work on the environmental side. You have, can work also on the social side. On the environmental side, instead of using styrofoam for McDonald's, if you remember a few years ago, used to use styrofoam packaging. Yes. Yes. They got to the realization styrofoam is not good for the planet. So they have migrated away from styrofoam. So there are many things a, a food chain company like McDonald's can do on both environmental front as well as on social front. And Dr. Shade, I'm sure you have some other experiences to add on this. No, McDonald's has lots of opportunities. Surprisingly, if you look at at the end level at a McDonald's franchise, they have a strong influence on franchisees. Franchisees are their investors, customers, and actually their extension. And as a corporation, you can guide your franchisees in the way they localize and do business. They've done very well internationally. McDonald's is successful in a country like India, where beef is not even eaten generally by a majority of the people. Beef is not the mainstream, and they've figured out how to make new cuisines appropriate for that culture. They can do the same thing from an environmental perspective, where waste is a very key problem in the society. So much food is wasted. So much of the, uh, you know, the, the containers, as I think uh, Suhas talked about, 
but there's a whole procurement should you procure oil that they need to make fries different than the lard for example or something else there's a whole value chain where they can see carbon footprint that is printed uh, and i think mcdonald's is actually now getting aware primarily because the new generation of retailers fast food or rapid quick response restaurants as they're called really companies like starbucks are changing the paradigm it is not burger king it is not wendy's actually uh, but it is somebody outside the traditional food who is bringing about changes about what a retail franchise or franchisee should be doing and that seems to make a difference uh, and they will struggle because changes are hard from a process viewpoint as i mentioned but it's very doable and i am quite pleased uh, that mcdonald with new leadership is now becoming very conscious about this one can i just add one more thing before we pick up the next questions you know, in um, our analysis, Suas and I, we found the biggest car food, uh, footprint is not at the factory. It is at the point of consumption. A typical family puts more carbon footprint, about 70% of all the carbon footprint is because of the refrigerator sitting at home. The next place is the supermarket refrigerators. If you add the automobile, which we say at, at the consumer level primarily, so we have become very passionate to say ultimately how do you motivate the end the consumers to have a mindful consumption even though it's a small amount per consumer it adds up enormously because you now talk about billions of people or millions of people so we think mcdonald's can really do quite a lot they can provide choices in a way which are different than what they do if they make environment as their core strategy and again, I find fascinating, while consumers are hard to change, and now for the first time worldwide, people are becoming very conscious about the environmental impact of what we do in our lives. Great, so I have another question here. Um, it says, how does certification reinforce the audit process that you have at your website? Uh, yeah, I think a very simple answer to that. Uh, in our audit questions, we ask you a question, have you improved? For example, if you are works for a forest pro products company, the question in the audit process is, have you increased the certificate, uh, certified fiber usage versus last year? And if the answer is yes, you are improving and you're making progress on your sustainability journey. So yes, you need to incorporate certification as part of the audit process, but as sustainability is a journey, you don't need to have 100% certification. You can start with a small number, but every year you need to see an increase. And our audit tool can be customized for each individual company. If you need to do that, just contact us, we can help you design a survey just for your specific company. Great, I think uh, we've got time for a few more questions. Uh, another question is, uh, can you share some examples of companies that developed competitive advantage by embedding sustainability in their supply chain? Well, Haas, you wanna go? Yeah, I think uh, I'll talk about a couple of companies. The very first company is Patagonia, what Dr. Sheik talked about. Patagonia is the first company which advertises in a full page ad that you don't require this new jacket. Most of the companies, when we are used to providing more choices. So one learning what Patagonia had was the more jackets, different style jackets they create, the more sales they will have. And that's what they wanted to avoid. Now, as a company, you may say, what's wrong with that? Isn't our desire is to sell more jackets? No, they are selling more jackets, but they are selling more jackets to new people instead of selling more jackets to the same people because style has changed. So they have limited the number of SKUs, what they offer. They give you repair services. Another example I'll give you where, uh, is, is IKEA. IKEA worked with suppliers to improve sustainability across the value chain that not only reduce the cost to the end user 
but also created a bond between the supplier and, and IKEA. And then the last aspect I would give is probably is Unilever. Unilever has embedded sustainability as part of their core strategy. Uh, sustainability is not a separate strategy. The sustainable living plan is the strategy for, for Unilever. It basically yeah. talks about doubling the size of the business while reducing the impact on the planet in half. Dr. Sheikh, you want to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add one more thing. We found fascinating uh, AT&T on the wireless side, the cellular telephone part of AT&T. I was finding that cell phones are changing so fast. Obsolescence is so rapid, as Suhas mentioned, that they have a problem post-purchase now. People want to return old phones, what to do with it. So while they're doing enormous recycling, breaking it up, coming out with key components and reuse them, et cetera, but more importantly are now motivating the manufacturers of the cell phones, let's say the Apples or the Samsungs of the world, to redesign in a way so that the components themselves, they're not biodegradable yet, but you know the notion is that how can you make the components themselves less and less damaging after the use which is fascinating and we were surprised i must tell you i did not expect such a heavy heavy commitment uh, by at and uh, we talked to the chief sustainability officer and people and they shared so much of information to say that it is very linked not only in terms of post purchase consumption and disposal but we are now trying to work with, let's say, uh, GMA, which is a big platform association, all the manufacturers and the service providers. And they're also influencing other wireless companies, let's say Airtel, Vodafone, all over the world to say, this is an industry problem, not just my company problem. So can we have a combined procurement strategy that will motivate our suppliers to bring about changes uh, in terms of the way they create components or buy components or whatever they do. So that was impressive to me you know, in, in the research that we did. Uh, another example I would add to that is Xerox company. Uh, in our research, we found when Xerox leases you big Xerox machines, but when you move from one model to the other, 70% of the parts are recycled. They are able to use 70% of the parts. That's the way they design now the Xerox machine generations. So 70% of the parts from the old Xerox machine are reused into a new Xerox machine. Excellent. Thank you both so much. We'd like to thank uh, our speakers as well as our participants for their time today. This concludes today's edition of APEX Extra Live. Please mark your calendars for the next APEX Extra Live presentation on February 8th. You can learn more and register for this event in the near future at apex.org slash online event. All content and materials included in this edition of APEX Extra Live are the property of APEX and are protected by the United States and international copyright laws. All rights are reserved.